Right. Here we are with Mr. Ant Hopper. How are you doing, my friend? I'm very good, you? Yeah, all good, my man. All good. How's training going, like, in lockdown? What have you been uh, to? I've been on bike rides. That's the most training I've done at the moment. Uh, I haven't really trained much at all. I've got a gym. I own a gym, but I can't train. <laughs> it's like, was it being in the boat? We haven't got any water. Exactly. <laughs> one them ones. How's, um, like, the gym itself doing? Like, you doing much online stuff at the minute, or is it like, you know... Uh, no, I, I didn't go down the online route. Like, my gym is uh, the people from my area, like, rough. And, uh, like, I wouldn't say it's, like, low poverty-wise, but it's, like, it's not like other places in the country. And most kids would rather play on Fortnite than watch a training instructor video. And the same as the adults. The adults would rather be on a session than train over Facebook or Zoom. So, they want to play Fortnite as well, probably. Oh, well, they're doing like... <laughs> uh, the only time I use my PlayStation is for Netflix, and that's it. And you too. Pass and study like a good coach. There we are. Yeah, like a, like a <laughs> proper human being. <laughs> do as I do, in a way. Um, so how did your like martial arts journey start in the first place? How long ago did you get stuck in? Uh, when I was eight years old, I started boxing. Uh, amateur boxing. And I'd done that until I was 11 and had my first fight uh, in Scotland. And then it just went from there, really. I stayed amateur boxing until I was about 13, 14. Uh, won the schoolboy championships, won the junior ABAs. I beat Tony Jeffries twice. He's, uh, Did you beat Tony Jeffries? Twice. Fuck. Yeah, that's not really. So I have a couple of. Uh... Just drop that in there, all right? <laughs> oh, well, 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 well. I had a couple of uh, little debates with him on Twitter a few years ago, and that because he, he brought a book out and he said that he'd never been beat off any local lads. And I put him, "Well, did you forget about me?" He went, "Well, you beat us once, but I got robbed the second time." I was like, "Nah, you're wrong." School twice. School him twice. This is it. It's what you want. So what Only started? Want... What started the boxing in the first place? Then was it something you instigated or something you got sort of fell into? How did you get into it? Uh, my dad, my dad got us in there, me and my brother. Uh, my brother's like a year younger than us, like, and then we've got another brother now, but uh, we uh, we both go into boxing and we just stuck at it. So it wasn't because I was getting bullied inside school and all like that. Like, uh, generally, people start a sport because of it. I just got pushed into it, uh, which is a good thing, right, to be fair. So where, where did your sort of motivation come from at that point onwards? Because some people have that kind of fire from, I don't know, a background of either finding a reason to train it, like a reason is like, oh, to get in shape or to do this, that and the other. But if you did it for, I don't know, for fun and just because you like it, where did you well, find that kind of fire as such? Well, when you're young, you don't really need it, do you? Really, like, when I was boxing, I was like boxing every other week. Like you could you could box twice a week, you could box three times a week, and amateur boxing it's crazy. So you you always kept busy. You were never it was like never like oh I've got to go to boxing training. There was nothing else. Like my mates either played football or done boxing. There was there wasn't any other really martial arts apart from like karate. Do you know what I mean? I'm 35, so I'm not get old, but when I was like the butt. ten, <laughs> the butt is very important. <laughs> Right, well, that's very important. But when I was twelve and that, like the the only really combat sport you really knew about was boxing and karate, maybe judo. So where maybe. did the transition come from after boxing? And why, when when did you feel the need to change? Like what happened really? Uh, I went in the army, and uh, when I come out of the army, uh, I wanted to 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 like go back into boxing. And uh, my friend Michael Butler, he was a uh, doing jiu-jitsu and wrestling, uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu. Uh, it was pretty much the only jiu-jitsu the North East really had at the time. Ross Pearson had the same coach, uh, Andrew Fisher, uh, Colin Fletcher, Ryan Scope. We all come from like the the same same gym sort of thing. Uh, Pete McQueen and Stevie Black. Uh, and I, I just fell into love with it then. Uh, I had a fight, <laughs> a semi-professional fight, after six months of training, thinking I could just use me boxing, and got hooked down and tapped out in 30 seconds or something. It was unbelievable. Off Dave Wilson. I was like, fuck, I need to learn jiu-jitsu. Like, 
I mean, that's the kind of rude awakening people get when it comes to like grappling and stuff. Like, what were you doing like throughout the camp for that? Like, thinking, yeah, I'm hard as fucking now, sitting in the bag and now thinking, oh, he's gonna get one of these. Well, when I was when I, when I when I was sparring with people and that, I was just like, uh, like I was like, the, I wasn't getting talked down much in that, and uh, I just thought, oh well, just stick this in and I'll win. <laughs> and uh, turns out I was wrong. But Peter, like on the on the video I watch, I'm like lying on me back, and like my legs are just straight out in front of us. I'm just like lying dead on the floor, and letting him do what he wants to us because I didn't have a clue. Hello, sailor. Which. <laughs> oh, like I just didn't have, I just didn't have a clue. It was mental, and then uh, I stuck with MMA for a while, and then stopped training MMA, and then went back to boxing, and had uh, a lot of unlicensed boxing fights. Again, there's so much I want to break down from this. So let's take it back a little bit. So the army in itself. What was your, I don't know, plan from with the army itself? Was it kind of like a a whole career was it something you wanted to always wanted to do what was your thoughts with that in the first place well in the area i'm from back then it was a uh, a lot of car crime and stuff like that so my mum pretty much forced us into the army i didn't want to go to the army i got like forced into the army and i hated every single minute of it i was in for two and a half year i hated it it was horrible it was crap it was boring like hated it tell me what you really feel <laughs> don't, yeah, hold, yeah. don't hold back. I, I got I got more, in, more bother in the army than I would have if I wasn't in the army. I ended up doing forty eight days in Colchester for fighting. I ended up getting my tooth knocked out, and I got sent to prison for it. So it was like crazy. Not the ideal soldier at that point. So like, what oh, I was, well, soldier. Like I was like I was in the light infantry, and like everybody in the light infantry is tiny and fast, and I was like tall. And I wasn't fat then, but I was skinny. But I was still like not like their stamp, you know. I was still like six foot or something at the time. When I, went in, I think I was 21, 21 when I went in the army. But the good thing about the army, I learned is how to be a man and learned is how to be disciplined. Changed my attitude. I mean, that's little... an interesting way you've sort of described that then. So you went from you went there, you didn't like it, you hated every second of it, but then you came out kind of matured because of the result of it what part of it do you feel really i don't know stuck with you as such because obviously if you don't want to be there in the first place trying to resist everything at well how do you feel it sort of i don't know you let it help you as such well good for fitness but at the time i wasn't like i wasn't really interested in that you know uh but just me attitude was like showing more respect to people and stuff like that not that i was like i wasn't a little shit didn't it goes wrong but like i was like cocky like a cocky Charlie, you know, and uh, I think being in the army surrounded by men and like just getting dragged about in mood, cold weather, rain, like sort of like <laughs> makes you a man sort of thing. Well, this is it getting like broken down to have to like, okay, now I've got to listen. I've got the energy to be like, you know, obnoxious and like, you know, not listen. I've got to actually like, <laughs> figure it out at this point. So post army then, did you have a kind of plan where you wanted to go from there onwards or was it like, just keep training and keep you out of trouble. What was your kind of plan from there onwards? Yeah, uh, I did. Uh, to be honest with you, I, did, I didn't really have any plans. I was uh, I, I done like a bricklaying course where Ryan Scope's dad was the was the teacher. Mm. Uh, I done like stuff like that. Uh, like just like it was like thirty pound a week, and you were there like five days. It was like it was like a, a course, but it wasn't like an apprenticeship. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I was in and out of stuff like that. I even worked in McDonald's. I lasted two weeks, and not because of all the food either. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I, I just didn't like the job. It was like wasn't for me. No, it was horrible, a horrible job. I just I had jobs all over. I've had like everybody laughs at this because I've had like every single job, pretty much gone. Like Mr. Ben. <laughs> uh, really. I know, uh, like a master of none though. Like I just. Good old I didn't. St- this is it. So with your training then, so you've gone from boxing, doing really well, being Tony Jeffries twice, and then you're in the army, you start doing MMA as well. So like regards of where's your training at this point? So you're out of the army, are you actively training still? Or are you just trying to find out yeah. where you're going to earn your money in the first place? I, I started training before I went in the army because uh, I went to the army selection uh, and failed uh, 
the medical because I was too heavy. Because you, like your BMI has got to be right. Mm. So then I, I, I had to take six months out and I, I just start like jogging and stuff like that, uh, doing weight training with my dad and stuff. Uh, and then and that's when I got into the army. And then when I was in the army, the weight, I was like dead skinny. Uh, and then I obviously come out and then I like sort of like went partying over the town a bit. Never took drugs, but like I just wanted to be out every weekend. As a as a young lad does, you know. Are you sort of Billy Bollock singing "I'm a soldier"? Oh, hey, don't mind me, I'm a soldier. Well, if I used to tell you the way I used to dress, we used to like have like a checky shirt or stripy jumpers and a pair of leather gloves and stuff like that. And honestly, it was hideous, of duffel jackets and stuff. <laughs> you sound like you're in wacky races. What the fuck is that? Uh, <laughs> you, you, you kind of thing. Not from Sunderland. Like the rave culture and that. You like it's it's like that, that sort of stuff. That's the way we used to dress, it's been mental. Oh, you wouldn't like any pictures. I'm quite, I'm kind of scared to ask, but that's a conversation for afterwards, I think. Uh, <laughs> when it, so, so, let's keep going in the story then. So, you're in your, doing all this, you're enjoying the sort of high life, so to speak. So, then what? What's your kind of plan from there onwards, like with training and stuff? Is it still competing or is it just doing it for fun? What was your plan uh, on that side of things? I think I, I think I had a couple of, couple of years out. I didn't like do anything, and then uh, <clears throat> unlicensed boxing become big. I don't know if you heard of the ABF. In what sense uh, is that? Is that Benock or is that just normal boxing? It's just normal boxing. It's just like, wait, you, uh, I'm saying like it's normal boxing. It's I seen some scenes there. Like it was a uh, wasn't very cool. <laughs> that now, uh, but like you know, people used to wear six ounce gloves, and people used to get disqualified a lot you know it was just like people just getting in a boxing ring and just having a having a scrap i thought uh, a pro called lee wiggly i think he was like an ex-pro but he was like he had like 380 odd like unlicensed boxing fights but he was a bit of a journeyman he just used to come up now he was probably the hardest fight they had well this is, uh, that's kind of people are always quite durable they've been you know, experienced they've been in the um in the fire of it all I was just hitting him, he was just laughing at us. I was like, what's going on here? Yeah? It's a big muscle roll in. I was like, fuck. But uh, I enjoyed it, right, to be fair. So, what, what happened then after that then? So, you're doing your boxing. So, you're boxing, MMA, boxing again. Are you still grappling at all? Are you learning any of that? No. Uh, my grappling was still terrible. I was still going through my Japanese Jiu Jitsu belts, but it was like more syllabus based. So, it wasn't like, it's totally different to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, so I, I got back into it. Uh, like I got off like opportunity of taking over a gym. It was a weightlifting gym, and it had like a like a, a room out the back with a few mats in it. And that's that's really what goes back in the martial arts. That opportunity. Kind of like a um, Gracie garage kind of thing. <laughs> well, I it was it's like I've still, I was in the same place now, but I've just like absolutely ripped everything apart, and now I've got like one of the biggest gyms in. Like size wise in in the North East. Well this is it as well. I mean the size of the facility itself and the sort of people you're kind of producing, like talk me about you and Josh's sort of relationship. How when did he sort of come to the gym and you guys start working together? It was his dad, his dad was training in the gym, using the weights, and uh he said that his son was planning to come up and he he'd done a bit martial arts in the past, I think it was kickboxing, uh in Berwick. And he come down, he's like this little chubby kid with like star wars t-shirts and that on nothing against anybody that wears star wars t-shirts by the way but like it's not really seen in our area uh and he just said he wanted a training that's where it started i think it was 15 15 when just come to my gym so when he started to that kind of age and you've sort of built him up from there onwards how do you find seeing him compete and like getting him in there with things because obviously like you hear most coaches say the sort of where the heart and sleeve of it, they get really sort of, I don't know, emotion invested. How do you feel when it comes to Josh's fights? I get pissed off with him. Like, because, <laughs> like, every fight camp, like, I'll see him and he's meant to be cutting weight. And then I'll see him eating, like, a, a Greg's pasty or something. And, like, he tries to hide all Patrick Chris. So I'm always shouting at Josh. Like, literally shouting at him all the time. But he's, <laughs> I mean, he's only 20, he's only just turned 22. And he's there. Uh, I mean, He's got he's got a load of talent. Honestly, it's unbelievable. But he's just had really tough fights, especially in Cage Warriors. 
and he's just come up, he's come up with a little bit of stuff, you know. Do you think the pressure, the moment itself? I can't speak on behalf of him, but the sort of moment itself, because he's get, go against guys like Steve Amiable or like Chris Edwards, he's kind of like experienced competitors as well. Like, do you think the well, moment I, itself sort of gets in his own head with it? No, that's exactly. We've spoke about this uh, last week, and like I said, something like. What's happening because like he spawned with like lads from the North East, like Perry Goodwin, mm-hmm. uh, Louis Monarch. You know, he's getting he's getting some really good spawn and he's not like out of his depth, you know. And I just think we sell like there's something missing. Like there's definitely something missing. And when I spoke to him, he says sometimes the pressure of being in there with all the many people sometimes gets to him. And he kind of performed his best ability. But I thought his fight with Steve Inville was amazing. Uh I think if he kept up the second round, the same as the third, he would have beat Steve Amble. But it was just the takedowns. He's, he doesn't. He needs to start concentrating more on wrestling. And in the, in the North East, I mean, TFT, Fisher's Gym, like we get on with everybody, you know, he can always go and train there with Justin, Berlinson, and all the other lads from there. So the opportunity is there for him. He just needs to get his piece on in there. Order, you know. I mean, this is a really interesting concept of things because when it comes to the mental side of fighting, it's one of those things that seems to be pushed to one side. Of like, okay, I've got my nutrition, I've got my like physical side of there. I'm all, you know, I'm wet, I'm fit, and ready to go. But that side of getting in your own head and how you deal with that moment in itself, because ultimately, if you take away the crowd and everything else, it is, you know, nitty gritty is what you've been doing every single day. <laughs> it, it it isn't anything new. But the fact you're adding these extra factors and the way you deal with it, like say for example the Chris fight, Chris Edwards fight, driving over to Wales and that kind of whole experience, like it's not going to be an overnight thing. And talk me through that fight, that camp itself. Like how? Well, that, that yeah. Was it was amazing. He done everything right. Us so were going to keep the fight standing. We knew that uh, Chris Edwards would not be able to stand with Josh, uh, like we're seeing on the first round. So everything was right. His wake up was all right, stuff like that. Uh, he, his wake up was actually really good. Uh, but at the time when he fought Chris Edwards, you know, he's, you got to think he was only twenty years old. Twenty years old, and he's gone like up against someone like Chris Edwards that's had a lot of fights. Uh, the most cage Warriors fights, the most fights in Cage Warriors any Cage Warriors fight I had. If that makes sense, way of phrasing that, I mean, he's had the most. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So we, we drove down. It was on the Friday night. Me, me brother owns an amateur boxing club, and was, Josh actually worked the door at my brother's boxing event the night the night before he's weighing, just to get just to take his mind off things. That's what he likes to do. He likes to like keep himself occupied. So we've done that boxing event. The boxing event finished at twelve o'clock, and we left for Cardiff that night. So I drove with like after being at work all day. Helping me brother with his boxing show, and we drove to Wales that night. We we left about twelve o'clock at night, and we didn't get there till eight o'clock in the morning. That was the worst drive of my life. Fucking hell! So those eight hours. So talk to me about that then. So was it like a lot of like service stops? Was it traffic? Or was it just like the journey itself? Well, we we stopped a few times and stuff like that, but it was like it was just it's it's miles away. <laughs> it's literally like Sunderland is miles away from everywhere. That, that that end of the woods, like it's just, it's it's like a different country, you know. Well, literally, literally, literally. <laughs> like it just the journey wise, it's just honestly, it's, it's it's horrendous. Plus, you know, I kept to the speed limits because I was in my. Anyone listening? <laughs> well, when, when I went to Josh's uh, fight in Colchester, we used Josh's little Fiesta thing, like a new Fiesta thing, and little um, hairdresser's car. Uh, we're, we're absolutely screwed the balls. I think we got to Colchester in like three and a half hours. It was class. <laughs> it was just like, class. Man, it's all the way down. I don't know why, but there was some like people taking pictures of us on the way down. <laughs> but, it's like celebrities. Like, there we are. <laughs> yeah. But I went to Cardiff for my car, so I was sensible. Basically, you got to be to your own um, thing as well. So, <laughs> regards to Josh's, like the conversation in the car down there, well, across there, where, where you want to look at it. How did you, was it anything like fight rate as such? Would you try and keep him switched off? How do you try and get involved with that side of things? I just let, I just let him relax. I mean, the, the day before we in, I just let him relax. I didn't really speak about the fight uh, because we've done everything in the gym leading up, to, leading up to the fight. We've done everything. So 
that time he's like weird cut, you know, he's he's thirsty, he's hungry, his uh, sugar levels are all low and it, it, like everything's just all messed up. So he just he just relaxes, just chills, I'm just say like just go to sleep. Just sleep and then when you wake up it'll be there. Uh, that's pretty much what we do for every fight, we'll just let him relax, uh, let him chill, and then after the weighing, he has food and then we'll start speaking about like just be patient and just like like enjoy the moment sort of thing and don't do anything stupid. Don't fight for the crowd like Eamon will fight. Uh, you know, he, he fought with the crowd there. He, sh- he shouldn't have fought with the crowd, you know. Which oh. fight was it you were saying, like, <laughs> he was meant to think to fight at, like, lightweight or something and then he woke up at 66 or something by accident? Someone that was uh, when he fought at Cage Warriors Liverpool against... Uh, who did he fight down there? Oh... Early fight. You fought to me from a uh, Polly Pimlet's gym. Oh, okay. So I thought he was. Um... I'm definitely not going on topology to find out. I'm trying to use my memory. Hmm. <laughs> it <laughs> would have been. Let me just think. Oh, I'm thinking of all the guys at Paddy Pimlet's gym that fight in the featherweight and lightweight divisions who are on. Definitely not on topology, but I'm trying to find now whilst my internet's taking so long to load. It is... Elliot Jenkins? Elliot Jenkins, that's the one. Ah, oh, memory serves me right as Elliot Jenkins. Ah, uh, pretty good memory there. <laughs> so, Elliot Jenkins in a... Like, weird in at featherweight. Like, I just couldn't believe it. I wanted to pull him out, but he's like... I didn't like really control him I like, saw so he turned pro at an early age at 18 which I was totally dead against but like it's his career you know you've got to you've got to you've got to help him I kind of just like control his life and say look you, you can it you know see him down there I said look I says this is stupid I said he's going to be like 80 kilo if not more or less you know and I says you're going to be just even touching 70 kilo he's good well he says I've trained and you know, this lad's trained as well and stuff like that. So he really, he took the fight himself. And uh, got, I think he got caught in an arm triangle. Hmm. Uh, he took that loss quite bad, to be fair. But LA Jenkins was he's pretty good, you know. I just think he just, Josh underestimated and, he, you know, he just didn't didn't give it any thought of his own health and his, his own weight, you know. I mean, this is where it gets, something gets tricky being a fighter and versus being a smart like athlete as such because the fight mentality is you know fight anyone no matter what you know confidence in yourself but also making these kind of smart decisions especially at pro amateur you can fight what you want and kind of get away with it to an extent but weight category is always a funny one as well like it's, it's always a bit of a because you know how much it takes to get down to certain amounts but also where you're actually sitting at and what you should be fighting at is always up in the air like where do you, how do you sort of advise me this kind of thing? Like, obviously, it's meant to be his journey, but also being a coach and, you know, looking out for his best interest. How do you find, I don't know, putting your foot down with those kind of things? Well, there's a, there's a lot of fights where I've been offered off Cage, cage Boys with Josh and uh, I've always refused them because you, you can ask Josh and Josh will fight anybody. He fought uh, the lad term pro boxer, uh, Billy Sniff. He, he had a lot of boxing fights and Josh went on there, like, Three hours notice, three hours notice, and went in, went five rounds, and in my opinion, Josh punched his lips off, uh, and got robbed. But that's a different story. Video on YouTube, uh, if people want to check to see if I'm lying. But uh, that's the type of person Josh is. You know, he just he'll honestly his game is out. But I think it's that little like I say that little bit of pressure. So you've got to control him. You've got to like say look. Like you, you're early in your career. Most people don't turn pro until they're this age. You didn't really want a negative record. Do you know what I mean? People know he's tough. People know the people he's fought and he's being beat off. He just needs to be patient and just wait. You know, he phones at two o'clock tonight and said, "Oh, do you think I should fight this one, or do you reckon I could fight this one in my next cage?" Where I'm like, "Josh, man, like we labor us just going to sleep." <laughs> I mean, you just fought the day before. Just chill. Be out in the car park shouting at people saying, Oh, do you want to go back inside and have another fight? <laughs> Just trying to like get stuck in. You, you look at him and he looks like he looks like a little spice boy, doesn't he? 
he's actually tough. Like he he, he used to work the door for us in a in a nightclub, the only nightclub in Sunderland. Like, and he he yeah, uh, there's been a few times where like every fight he's had in there, he's won because <laughs> he just. <laughs> He just looks like a little glass clip then and you just get picked on off the like especially at Christmas time there was like some lads from this football team up all way and they were fighting with each other two football teams. And you see on the camera and they pin them up and against the wall and then all of a sudden Josh is just like slinging knuckles and just honestly it was unbelievable. To watch like if if anybody's listening to this you might think I'm lying. I'm totally not lying. It's true. He is a tough little kid like well, this is where you got to kind of almost protect him from himself because as much as, you know, he's got that chin, he's got that durability, it's also miles on the clock at the end of the day. Like, it's all well and good early on in the career where he can, you know, take these shots and he can put himself in these sort of firefights. Even in like, when he's working the, uh, working the doors and the rest of it, it's still finding that kind of grey area mm-hmm. of when to sort of prioritise that as such. Like, well, that's it. That's why he's had, he's had a bit of a break. I don't know if you notice. We've been offered fights enough, but I've just I told Ian Dean, he's he's not ready. He needs time. Just like you know, give him a bit of time. He needs a couple. Of, he needs a couple more wins. Only if he's he's belt. He needs to have the right fights. Like, I mean, Steve Ian, but we knew that was going to be a hard fight. But I honestly thought Josh could actually beat him. Uh, there was no reason why he couldn't. And I don't know. Did you watch that fight? Mm, absolute war. Pair him, so, blood. It was, it was fucking back and forth. So, and Steve's coach at the end of that fight, and Steve will vouch for this. Steve wanted to give in after the second round. He wanted to give in. He says that he just Josh just wouldn't leave him alone inside there. He was like on him, you know. So, I mean, and I mean, he's just fought for the, the world title, hasn't he? Mm. Steve, you know what I mean. Steve's a lovely lad, like. Didn't get us wrong. He was a. Uh, it's the first time I met him, but he, he was he is he was a lovely lad, like. But I think I think if Josh, like I said, if Josh continued after the after the first round, Josh got beat, he was on his back. Uh he was trying, but his wrestling let him down massively. And then second round, I thought Josh took it. I think if Josh kept the pace and his hands up, he would have won the third and possibly won the fight. I mean Steve was an absolute gentleman. I had him on the podcast a little while ago. And again, it's a really interesting kind of conversation as to how back into the sort of mentality of Josh, obviously not speaking on behalf of him, but what must have been going on through his head, thinking that round by round of that confidence and, I don't know, almost respecting these guys too much that when it comes to, oh, I'm against someone who's much more experienced, all this, that, and the other, these kind of doubts when, you know, ultimately their experiences are in the past and that moment there is, you know, who they are. And giving him that extra sort of respect is almost detrimental to himself in some points. But again, it's an interesting thing to really delve into. Definitely. Definitely. I thought, did you watch the Chris Edwards fight or not? Yeah, I saw that flying triangle you went for the last couple of minutes, whatever it was. I was yeah. If he got that, I'd have been like, oh, Josh, I'd have been, you know, even on the um, highlight reels and that. See, so call me biased, but I, I, I don't know how he got the unanimous result off that. That's just my opinion, you know. Uh, and I am going to be a little bit more biased because he's my fighter. But I don't know. I think that was a little bit too close to call that one. I need to watch it again to make another another comment, but I felt it was the right decision as such at the time. It didn't seem like Josh's head was really in there, but again, it's all... Mm. It's, it's an interesting one. In itself, anyway, how do you find coaching in the first place? Where, how did that come quite natural to you when you set the gym up in itself? Well, stand-up-wise, we'll say, we started off stand-up. So when I was coaching, it was stand-up-wise. Uh, and us were just a lot of unlicensed boxing fights and stuff like that. Uh, we've done really well. We've got a good reputation, and then uh, we start moving on to martial arts MMA, and uh, I ended up having a really good amateur team. I had some really good lads uh, fighting, which is good. It was good, and that's what started making a little bit of an impression. So, regards to your influence to coach, how do you like to learn, and how do you like to teach? As such, like, well, how do you take information? Are you hands on? Do you write things down? Are you Quite meticulous with things. How do you like to learn a certain? John, I study stuff. Uh, I'm not really one for writing things down, but like, I'll, I'll, I, I look at a fight. So I could be watching the UFC. I could be watching something, and I pick points of people's movement and uh, the way they control themselves and control the body in in fights. Uh, and look, look, look for like 
situations. I mean, like the amount of times you've you've obviously fought amateur MMA yourself, haven't you? I've seen it. And how many times has your coach seen more from the outside than you see from the inside? Well, this is it. What you think you do versus what you're actually doing are very different conversations. So you see, what, what you see from the outside is a lot more important than you're seeing from the inside. That's why they give advice. And I, I, I can judge a fight really well on that by another fighter making mistakes. But it's up to the fighter to then go out and listen to what I've been saying. But I think at amateur level, it's hard to get that into the head because they're just in there. And the natural thing, the first thing that comes to the head is to fight. So when when you, you're in there, your coach at the end of the first round will say, right, his right hand's down. He keeps on faking that teeth or whatever. He's, he's keeping on faking takedowns. But what I've just told you in a minute, is that you haven't took it in. And you go back out the same game plan. This is the really tricky thing when it comes to that difference between amateur and professional is that kind of composure and that timing and that assessment of everything else going on. Because again, with the obviously the round lengths as well to figure someone out, and when you say the level of detail of, okay, st- keep moving to the outside, keep doing this, that, and the other, they're just trying to think, okay, fine, I'm listening, I'm listening. But as soon as that clacker goes, like, okay, <laughs> completely ignored yeah. all of it. Whereas pro, you kind of have to really figure each other out instead of just sort of swinging. Obviously, it's case by case, but as a whole, it's that much more detailed kind of breakdown. And also trying to take that in, like, when it comes to your cornering, how much detail do you like to give? Are you quite, I don't know, do you like to try and build them up in the sense of you're doing really well based on that kind of morale oh. kind of boost? Are you more of that sort of... I'll tell them how it is. Uh, so when when they're fighting, like, I don't shout much at all because, you know, you're in there, you're fighting, you've trained for this. I can only tell you your mistakes or tell you to watch out for. A lot of coaches shout just too much advice. They're saying too much. It just doesn't even make sense. And the fight is not going to be able to hear this, you know. So I just keep a level tone when I'm in the corner. And just when the line shots and that, like show like a lot of good, like good stuff. And then in between rounds, then that's when I have the word with them. I get them, let them have a breath, get a drink, and then I speak. And I'll just tell them if they're doing bad, I'll say, you've lost that round. And I'll tell them that you lost that round by 10 8. Let's pick yourself up. But it depends which fighter, because some fighters you might tell them that and they just give in. So you've got to work on, on, on the fighter. So whatever fighter you, you're coaching at the time, you need to make it for them, you know. But Josh, Josh like, just tells us what he's going to do. So it's like, Josh, right, you need to keep your hands up a lot more. Uh, and he's like, right, no problem. Uh, do you think I, if I try this, do you think this will work? I'm like, wait, we didn't try it in training, so I don't think it's like the way that we try it now. He's just, he's honestly, he's nuts. He's, <laughs> easy, he's easy, work, but he's hard as well. I don't know, that makes any sense, but it's true. He's not like his dad. <laughs> uh, he thinks, well, he says the same, like, I, I just, I get on to him all the time, that, like, so. <laughs> Take your shirt. Just, <laughs> don't pick uh, your nose. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, for a lot of other fighters, that's like, like really good to deal with. Do you know, like the perfect, the weights are perfect and stuff as well. So, so you got to take the rough with the smooth, wouldn't you? Well, that's part of the process as well. If it was all straightforward and everything else, there wouldn't be much of a conversation with it. And again, on top of everything else, like, how do you find? I don't know. When it comes to building these relationships with the fighters, how far do you think you have to push them to find out what works and what doesn't? Or is it a case of they show you their cards as to what they like to be taught in a certain way? Or is it, I don't know, see something and see their reaction? Uh, I, I just, I'll go with it and then see, see what the reaction is. Uh, if somebody doesn't like something, then I, then I start working on what they don't like. Or what they, like, a lot of fighters might, like, prefer to stand and, not defend takedowns. Like some some people are happy to be fighting off the back, and that's all. What I do is I try to get them out of that routine as well, uh, and help help them on the weaknesses. So working on the weaknesses instead of the strengths, as well as working on the strengths as well. You know. So if say if a fighter has got no wrestling, and then obviously we need to work on the wrestling. If a fighter's 
no if he's on his feet, then obviously we need to start working on the feet a little bit more and like forget about the jujitsu side of things. So we'll do takedowns with no like we'll do MMA with no jujitsu, but you still still can hit on the floor, and then they've got to get back up off the floor and stuff like that. Well, that's quite interesting as well. Do you do a lot of specific kind of training, and how specific is your fight training as such? Do you do like I don't know, like fight simulations, as like John Kavanagh kind of describes it as, or is it more? Smaller details, but more drilled out as such. Uh, we'll do a lot of like sparring in fight camps. So a lot of t- we'll do we'll do drills, but we'll do a sp- specific sparring. So say uh, he's fighting a boxer, or one of the lads is fighting a, a wrestler. We'll we'll the full fight camp will be around that fighter. So it'll be more pacif- Pacific. Specific powering or specific sparring. Here we are. <laughs> a little well, everything, twister, isn't it? Just everything. So just making sure the fight is right, you know. Like like I say, like we, we could do a two hour class for one of the fighters. We'll try to get like three or four or five fighters in at the same time, whether it be pro or amateur. And we'll do like shark tanks. I don't know. Have you heard of them? Yeah, yeah. So so when they, they learn more when they're, when they're at the weakest, when they're oh. tired and they kind of in the field as well, they kind of go on anymore. That's when they're learning. This is this is when they've got to push themselves. With your shark tanks, how do you like to do them? Because we do them mainly against the wall and those kind of sort of drills for that kind of urgency. Are you like positional or such? Is it situational, if you see what I mean? Uh, so see if we're going to do like five fives. Mm. One, the first five might be up against the cage wall or inside the cage. The second one might be if somebody's got your legs locked off and you're on your arse and you're getting pushed up against the cage uh, while still getting hit. Uh, obviously, not like yeah, yeah, trying to... Yeah, uh, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, just, a, just a annoying, you know, to make them work. So we'll, 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 round by round, we'll change it. And then we'll work, we'll work from there. I mean, this is always an interesting concept as to how you can develop that urgency because urgency is the biggest word I feel the difference between MMA and Jiu-Jitsu is that kind of that need to get back to your feet, that need to get a position, that need to do something else because you see it time after time when people are either tired or complacent, I feel like at the end of a round or whenever just to get back to their feet and really make a statement. And obviously trying to get that inspiring is always a tricky one to try and emulate, especially when it comes to pressure and damage in this kind of conversation. When it comes to transitioning from amateur to pro, how do you find that training as such? Do you incorporate those kind of, I don't know, insights to try and think where a knee and elbows could be? Do you do it on the pads a lot more? How do you change those rule sets when it comes to training? We try to do a lot more on pads. We, we, we don't let like, the lads throw elbows and knees and spawn. We can simulate it in technical sparring, but not like not in full contact spawn. Because the heart the heart to control on that. Like an elbow can cut you even if it's I don't really like using percentages, but say people say that fifty percent spawn. Even if you throw an elbow at one percent, you've got a chance of cutting them. You know, it's bone on bone, so you, you've got to be really careful. A uh, couple of lads wear like uh, elbow pads and knee pads, so they can simulate them just for that little bit extra safety. But I think the transitions are massive from amateur to pro. Though. Do you think it's massive. Be like an interval, kind of like a semi-pro kind of thing, like a variation. You know how Muay Thai has loads of different rule sets as such. There was, there was back in the day when I when I. Fought started even doing MMA there was amateur so you you'd wear shin guards uh, you'd wear normal at the time there were four ounce gloves like just normal pro gloves and but there would be only body shots so you can't hit to the head so I think that's like C class now isn't it and yeah, then it used, you, to be, um, thing, it? It used to have A B and C class amateur then it was just pro I think uh, but now back then it was amateur, semi-pro, and pro. And semi-pro, you could punch, kick to the head. It was all with like uh, pro gloves on, but you couldn't hit on the floor. Uh, I think maybe uh, somebody took the knees out of amateur MMA because I know when us were fighting on uh, Ice FC, you could knee to the head at the time. So I think so. I think bringing knees back should should people should bring knees back. And I think that, that that would get you more or less ready because then you're thinking more. I think that's a huge sign of transition with knees because you get these kind of points of contact and these kind of things as well of 
when it comes to getting back to your feet, it's building these habits and the uh, complacency. And I don't know, because you get like things like one FC when you can sort of lead the head anywhere on the ground. And that changes mm-hmm. it a lot. Like, what? Needs, needs to the head on the ground. Yeah, I think they can do that still. I think that's no, what. What needs needs to be the head on the floor. Mm. One FC. Oh, I, I one FC. You can kick to the head on one FC, don't you? Yeah, I think you can soccer kick. I'm not sure. They, the uh, rules are a bit all over the place. I think. I I, I don't agree with needs to the head on the floor, like because I think that's just like that's taking it away from sport. Then and I think you can cause a lot of like serious injuries. You know what I mean? Even though it was good in the UFC days, but I think. Just for the safety of the fighters, because you've got to think a fighter, it's a job for them, you know. They don't want to get paid as well. When it comes to MMA making it more, I don't know, more of a sport, more marketable, do you feel we should incorporate more pads and stuff? You know, like the IMAF, that kind of thing. Do you feel there's Uh, more of a place for it? I I think, I think with that IMAF, I think they do some good things and they do some bad things. I think, like, in Ireland, you've got to be safe MMA, Hmm. registered to fight. I think that's stupid because you've got, like, like I say, a lot of people from not well, pop, like, people haven't got money. Do you know what I mean? And to go and get brain scans and all that and blood tests. I mean, blood tests is pretty. People might hate us for that, but I mean, Martin Shaw neighbor's got AIDS is kind of important, like, isn't it really? You know. I, Depends I how think well that <laughs> back control, how tight that is, but either way, different conversation. Uh, right, right. Depends if the drop drop slips to the side. But I think I think the team are a bit too far for the amateurs, you know what I mean? I think the referees, especially in, in our area, we've got like some really good uh, referees. I think it's the referee's job to keep fighters safe, and it really I mean they, they kinda of stop everything from happening, you know, trauma and stuff, but I think amateur MMA needs to be kept the way it is. I think there's too many rules getting in place and too many like CFM and me is getting involved too much. They're just a nightmare, to be honest with you. Like. Well, this is where it gets kind of tricky, is where that sort of grey area is of keeping people safe, but also making it too too hard to make it a sport. Because it used to be no holds barred, you know, no gloves, no nothing, kicks to the balls, crack on. And now it's, you know, <laughs> gloves, gum shield, groin guards, and certain rule sets. And then there's it edges a little bit too far on the side of, okay, headgear. Oh God, no, 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 no! But you can't have this. But you can't have that. But you can't have that. And it's these kind of weird political decisions, and also the budget behind it. Because if you take what an amateur fighter is, it's a, essentially a hobbyist. Like I'm going to say hobbyist in the sense of it's not their career. They're not making money from it. No, but it's just like amateur boxing, isn't it? Like they're no. doing they're doing just a progress. I have a progress a pro, or just to to, to do it because they enjoy the sport. Listen, I say hobbyist in the most respectful term because the sense of you're not making money from it. So this is no. something you want to spend X amount of money on just to get in there in the first place. Like, yes, you're going to spend money on your gym. You're going to spend money on the gear to do it. That's, that's given. But to go through the regulations, like if you take the IBJJF, for example, paying that registration fee before you even paid for a competition, like, you tell me you're happy about doing that. You tell me you want to spend 100 quid just to get a badge that says your name. Well, I'll compete in mostly every IBJJF. Co- <laughs> so that's probably... That's probably is a bad question for me. Uh, I think, uh, to be honest with you, the thing is, what I think about the IBGGF is that it's a, it's a legit competition. I mean, there's no way to hide anywhere once you compete. It doesn't matter what the competition it is. Uh, but I think, to, like, I think the IBGGF is, if you're serious about competing in jiu-jitsu, that's the competition you need to be doing. Like. Now, this is where the point really comes from. Because that has prestige. That is the equivalent of professional jiu-jitsu, I feel. Because you're paying for that kind of entrance to that higher, I don't know, that tier of competition. So when it comes to the entry-level amateur, you shouldn't have to pay for that entry-level, you see what I mean? No, that's right. No, you're right. So this is where the transition right. really comes from. And this is why I kind of like that reaction of, you know, it's got that kind of prestige it deserves. Like it's got the extra weight behind it. And I also wanted to see what you'd say, because it's something quite funny to see if you'd go, if you'd bite. <laughs> and the most IBJJF ones, and their medals are unbelievable. I've got the European one now, because I've done the Europeans in January. Just drop that in conversation. Oh, I've got the European medal there, if you want to see that. Oh, the world, you know, I've got a couple. <laughs> but it's lovely. But the, the I mean, to, well, the point I'm getting is, like, to go to Lisbon 
and I've, I mean, I'm all heavy weight, as you can see. I mean, I know I look skinny, but I'm not. I'm actually 20 odd stone. But to go to the Europeans and compete against 18 other lads in your bracket from all around the world, because it's the Europeans, there was people from uh, South Africa and places like that. It's more like the world's. There's people from Brazil and whatever, you know. So to, to even medal in a competition like that is unbelievable. Honestly, the buzz is unbelievable. What was that competition like for your training? Obviously, the sort of the amount of matches, because normally when it comes to sort of heavier weight brackets, you get less and less people. So you're not used to having to get used to that fatigue between rounds and the rest of it. So what was your preparation like? Well, normally, you're right what you're saying there. Normally, there's only normally like four, maybe five max in a bracket mm -hmm. uh, at all the heavy weight. But I train really hard. I mean, you can ask Josh. Like, I roll uh, one hour solid, and then we'll do like 15 minutes of King of the Mat after. And I'm always the last one off the mat. And I will say to Josh and all the other lads, like, I'm 35 and fat, and I'm I'm the last one off the mat. I'm fitter than you. What's going on? Do you know what I mean? It's because I want it more. No, I, I, I'm spending money, like you just said, to com to compete. I'm spending money on flights, hotels, because we compete all over Europe, me and the Romanian, Gabriel. The Romanian. So, <laughs> <laughs> Romanian. so why why should I waste my money on just wanting to Make be average? I, or just to see I've been to a competition abroad? Do you know what I mean? That That would make no sense. Do you feel a pressure to compete to a certain level being a coach? Or would you take that in its own right as something separate? Well, I do now become a point because like I, I felt pressure to win more because I was a coach but uh, I've, I've left Team Legato now I don't know if you know that and I, I joined uh, Alliance uh, with Chris Short he's a black belt uh, I've known Chris a long time I, I've trained with him while I was at Legato but they are a serious competition team like that is the proper Jiu Jitsu club in the North East Alliance like uh, it's, it's rough there's no easy rounds and being coached as well rather than being a coach you know that's a massive difference in me in my uh, in my training to, towards competitions because I'm getting pushed I'm I'm not the best do you know what I mean there's always somebody better than us or I'm getting caught with something so it makes you switched on I think I rolled with Chris when I came down to I came up to um Alliance and I feel like he was the one who absolutely <laughs> wrote me off. <laughs> and you know, like when you get someone who's properly like a proper black belt, it's like, okay, I thought yeah. I knew jujitsu. I don't know what I'm doing because he's doing something else. <laughs> it's just a bit like, okay, it's a bit long. Run. I, I no disrespect any of a black belt in Sunderland or like but like you've got people that are black belts that don't compete. And I don't like. I'm not saying there's not there's like nothing wrong with that, but I think. Like if if you've worked you wheel from a white belt to a black belt and you you haven't completed, that's just mental. That's my take on it. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think I've had a so many well, a blue belt. I didn't compete at white belt. I, I went to a competition at white belt, and Josh hurt his ankle like a little girl and was crying on the mat before I went on. So we took him to the hospital. So I never really competed at white belt. I went, and I was standing there McGee, but I didn't compete. So all my, comp all my competitions have been at Blue Belt. I, I've, I've done a lot of competitions, a lot. Well, this is a lot. I see you um, on Facebook at the different events and the rest of it. And this is an interesting I've... conversation you've, you've made there with um, the black belts competing kind of thing, because obviously like each belt, you're most people are quite actively competing in a sense of at least one or two a year or whatever, they're just getting stuck in. And then almost when you get to that black belt, I think it becomes an extra statement of, oh, I'm the highest rank at this competition. I am, you know, this person. I need to perform to this certain standard on top of everything else and the other factors on top of that. But again, it's an interesting one of kind of testing your metal a little bit of, okay, I've earned this rank. I well, have to sort of show it. I went to Barcelona to do the European Masters. Uh, that was last year. I should have been there uh, in May this year, but obviously with the coronavirus, we couldn't. And I went there, uh, I'll say his name right, Hoja. Uh, Hobbin, Hobbin Gracie's gym. Bless you. Robin, Robin Gracie. <laughs> it's Helio's son. Hobson. You've got to call him Hobbin, aren't you? Because everything's got a H. 
Oh, the twin. So anyway, we trained with him, and uh, that was mental. It was good. I all kept him bound. Robin, Orion, <laughs> is that what you were trying to say? No, no. Robin, Robin Gracie. Oh, I'm getting mixed up with so many Gracies. Anyway, carry on. It's a, uh, it's Ho- it's Hollis Gracie's brother. And uh, a lot of the lads, they uh, they were there training for the Marcy Europeans. And uh, I got some rounds in with the black belts there. Was, honestly, that was amazing. Amazing. That was, like, really good. And then getting advice off, like, off of Gracie was unbelievable. It's quite surreal at that point. Well, I got I got uh, Hoist Gracie to choke us and sign a pair of Bellator gloves, which I've got, if you want to see. Oh, 100%. I've got the picture of him choking us out in when I when I had Ash fighting on Bellator 200. Wait, didn't he fight um Aaron Chalmers? Alright, uh, let's not talk about that, eh? Yeah, we'll cut that out. He called to my gym for that to train for that fight, and I honestly he should have by right he should have beat Aaron Chalmers. But whether he got paid the tackle drop, I didn't know because I'm not his manager. Oh, look at those fucking! So people listening on audio. Blue Bellator gloves with Hoist Grace signature on both the gloves. Look at that. It's beautiful. And I've got the picture of him. So he's choking us out on the chair. Yeah. Have you seen the picture? Yeah. I'll, if you've got it on your thing again, I'll have a look, look at it. It's on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, and then and then he signed the gloves for us. And I was like, it was it was awesome. Like, it was like a little fanboy. Oh, it was amazing. I bet you cried a little bit. Like, oh, my God. It's Hoist Gracie. Oh, my God. It's Hoist Gracie. Oh, my God. It's Hoist Gracie. <laughs> Well, I, the people that I've met through jiu-jitsu, I've met more people through jiu-jitsu than I have through MMA. I mean, I did meet, meet like some fighters from uh, Appella Tour 200 and that, like some like Chelsea Sunner and all that. Because we're staying in the same hotel as them and that was good. Chelsea Sunner, I'll just drop it in conversation again. He's 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 mint, you know. He's a proper proper mint mint guy. Well, was, uh, sorry, Karen. It was absolutely sound. Uh, it was good. I even I even got a video of uh, Host Gracie telling people I was his bodyguard. Oh, that's so cool. Was it on your Instagram as well? I think that's on my Instagram, all right? After uh, Bellator 200, I was back at the hotel together. And like, a lot of people trying to get his picture and that. He's like, hey, man, I'm with my bodyguard. It was like, <laughs> it was like me and Mooch. I don't know if you know Mooch. He's yeah. from a different job in. And he was like, hey, did you hear what he said there? I was like, why? I said, didn't tell anybody. I'm going to talk. But, uh, I have had some... I'm trying to find some... out. I'm scrolling back now. When was Bellator 200? When was that? Uh, back in June. Was it June? Two years ago? Was it 2019? Was it 2018? It's been 20... I think it was 2018. Oh, here it is. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures where people. I, I made Roy Nelson look like a middleweight. <laughs> don't make that me laugh at that, I feel mean. <laughs> that was actually quite funny. Yeah, that was cool. Awesome. Now, um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, my friend. Where can people find you? Where can people find those incredible pictures? Instagram, Anthopper, BGG. Most pictures now. I do a lot of DJing as well, so there's like a lot of DJing pictures on there. So even though it's just BGG, there's just I put everything on there. Uh, and Facebook, I'm proper on Facebook. What about the gym? Rotor Rough House MMA. Uh, there's a website and Rotor Rough MMA, MMA page. And uh, obviously, I've got a uh, an MMA event as well called Generations of Combat, uh, which is quite good. We've had about six shows successful. And that'll all be in the description. 